So before we swing into our presentation, I want to say good morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tony Gondola. I'm the outreach coordinator here at the museum and sometimes lecture giver. So always love to do these kind of things. Now as you can see, we've got a few rules that we're going to put out there. Number one, um, make sure all your cell phones are turned off or at least put on silent so we don't have an interruption because if we do film these lectures, they actually go up on our YouTube channel. So it's nice that we don't have any audio interruptions. And also please hold your questions uh, until the end of the talk. Um, it might be a little bit difficult uh, during this talk because we're going to cover a lot. But uh, if you could just hold your questions to the end, that'll uh, allow us to keep uh, on our time. time for the talk. Yes, exactly. So, we're going to be talking about exoplanets today. And for those of you who don't know what an exoplanet is, it's a planet that exists outside of our own solar system. Okay, So we're talking about planets around other stars. Now, just like we had the original seven, right? we have the original nine, the original nine planets. And for most of my lifetime, um, this is all we really knew about. It was really the only example that we had of the solar system. And so we had the four rocket <coughs> planets, we had the four gas giants, and little tiny Pluto out there on the end as a placeholder, which also is a planet in my opinion. Um, so very important. But this is really all we knew. When we didn't really know if our solar system was a quark, uh, if it was unusual in any way, we just had nothing to go by. And the reason is, in the pre-digital era, okay, when all we had basically were mostly ground-based telescopes that were using film to make their observations and make their photographs with, the idea of being able to see a planet around another star was really thought pretty much to be impossible. And like you say, you know, like seeing a candle next to a searchlight. The, the, the light coming from the star is just going to overwhelm any tiny planet that's just basically reflecting the light from the star. And you, you just don't really have a chance at all of being able to see it. And I think part of that reason, there probably were some things that we could have done, but I don't think we really tried because there was no reason to. And then in 1992, it all changed. Um, through observations of the pulsar B1257 plus 12, everybody's favorite, um, they noticed irregularities in its rotation rate. And I'll talk about pulsars and how all that works in a little bit. But they did their calculations and they realized that there had to be some other small masses that were pulling on this pulsar and affecting its rotation rate. And their calculations showed them that actually it was best answered by three planets in the system. Now this, it's really unusual, and this is not normally the way we find exoplanets. Um, this object is 23,000 light years distant. It's a very, very far object. Uh, it rotates one rotation every 6.2 milliseconds. That's really fast. And, and again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. And these pulsars are really uh, very unusual members of the cosmic zoo. And what they are actually, when, when you have a star that goes nova, goes supernova, and it explodes, sometimes it'll leave a black hole behind. Uh, other times it'll leave something called a neutron star. And here basically you're taking something that's the size of a star and you're squeezing it down uh, to something that's just a, a few miles across. And that's why the rotation rates are so fast because it's conservation of angular momentum. So as you get smaller, it's just like an ice skater uh, pulling in her arms, your rotation rate gets faster and faster and faster. And neutron stars are made up of what I would call degenerate matter. Um, ions, electrons, neutrons, all the stuff that would make up a star uh, atomically, it's all squeezed together as much as you possibly can squeeze uh, material. So extremely dense. Um, a thimble full will probably weigh as much as the Empire State Building, just to give you an idea of the density of these objects. So they're really very, very strange things. And one property that they all have, just like on Earth, you know, when you can get the, uh, the northern lights, okay, coming down through the poles, because that's where the electromagnetic energy uh, 
funnels, that's the only place it can funnel in. Well, with these objects, the energy can funnel out through the holes. And so it basically makes two sh uh, searchlights, if you will, that are, that are doing this. And if that searchlight sweeps across you from your point of view, then you can detect it and then you'll get a blip. So that's how we're able to measure these rotation rates that you see on these pulsars. And just to give you an even better idea, and I hope this is going to work, let's see. This is what it actually sounds like. So that's a relatively slow pulsar, about once a second. This is a much faster pulsar. Fractions of a second in one rotation. Almost sounds like a helicopter. And we can go even faster. When we get down to it's just a few milliseconds per pulse, you start actually getting an audio tone because they're just so fast. But just imagine that this body is giving out all of this energy and it's just rotating like crazy. It's pretty amazing stuff. But anyway, that's how we were able to find the first known exoplanets. Um, but it was unusual, you know, we didn't really know pulsars, okay, we can find it there, but, you know, they're really interested in finding planets that are around other stars, okay? And eventually, um, they did. And the first exoplanet ever discovered was 51 Pegasi, it's, um, orbits a sun-like star in the constellation of Pegasus. And uh, it was published in uh, 1995. Uh, distance is not that great, it's about 50 light years. The mass of a planet is about half that of Jupiter. But look at the orbital period. It orbits its star in under five days. So the length of the year on this planet is 4.3 days. So you have a very large planet that's very, very close to its uh, parent star, under 5,000 miles away. So one side of this planet, and it's probably gravitationally locked because it, it's so close, one side of this planet is super hot, almost 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and of course the back side would be super cold. So a very, very unusual world, not the kind of planets that we see in our own solar system. But as of September 2022, um, over 5,000 exoplanets of all kinds have been discovered. Um, and of course, there are many, many more out there, but the zoo is definitely increasing. So, to understand what's going on here, you have to kind of understand how stars are formed. Because building a star is a lot like building a house. You can't build a house without having a lot of trash that they have to take away in dumpsters like you call it, right? Well, kind of building stars and building solar systems is very much the same thing. Most of the stuff that collapses from that initial cloud of dust and gas goes into making a star. But there's always stuff left over. So you start off with a big cloud, maybe there's a supernova explosion somewhere, a shock wave comes through. Something happens to that cloud to destabilize it. And so what'll happen is it'll start to collapse. And it's as it becomes dense in one area, that has its own gravity and that tends to pull more material in. And the whole process just kind of builds on itself until eventually you have enough material that reaches a high enough pressure that you actually turn on a star in the middle of the thing. And then everything that's left over goes into the planets, comets, asteroids, all the other stuff that we see in our, in our own solar system. So if you think about how stars are formed, you really kind of get the idea that forming planets and other things, it's, it's kind of inevitable. Um, and the thought is now is that stars that have planets aren't particularly special. In fact, most, if not all stars, including multiple star systems, uh, have planets. Something that we didn't really know before. And these are actual photographs of um, a uh, planetary system and a star in formation. So you can see on the left-hand side, you've got the gas starting to spiral in towards the center. And on the picture next to it, you can see it's really starting to get well formed. Uh, the star has already turned on. And you'll notice that we have these uh, blank areas in the disk. And those are areas that have been gravitationally cleared out by objects that are actually in this, in this disk. 
And so they're already gravitationally interacting and kind of starting that huge tug of war, saying who's going to be the big planet, who's going to be the small planet, right? So it's a very chaotic, it's a very, it's a very <coughs> violent process. But it's almost a universal process, very common. And here's another example, uh, actual image. I think this one is a radio image, and again, you can see clumps of matter that are forming in this ring around this newly formed star. So we can, we can actually now, we, we have telescopes that are good enough um, that we can actually see these things happen. So finding the invisible, how are exoplanets discovered? Because remember, you have that really bright star, you have these really dim planets. Um, so you have to have special techniques that you're going to use to actually find these things and get an idea of what the population of exoplanets is, is really like and what these other solar systems are really like. Now, we, we talked about pulsars. Um, that's a good way to find them, but again, they're very, very unusual systems, and you're not going to find the bulk of your exoplanets this way. Um, so these are all, it turns out that, that there's a lot of different ways that you can detect um, exoplanets, and I'm not going to go into all of these, but if you look at the graph, you can see the vast majority of planets that have been discovered have been discovered using either radial velocity or transits, and I'm going to go into both of those techniques uh, in detail, because it's, it's kind of cool. So radial velocity is, is, is really pretty easy to understand. You know, if, you, if you're next to a train track and the train comes by, you hear the Doppler shift, right? So as it's coming towards you, the tone is low, and then as it passes you, the tone, okay? So that's kind of basically the same thing, but it's not sound waves that are doing it, it's actually the light that's doing it. So if you look at the spectrum of the sun or any other star with a high enough resolution, you're gonna see that that rainbow spectrum is cut by all these black lines. And each, all these black lines are representatives of elements that are actually in the atmosphere of that star. And the starlight is coming through the cooler gas in the atmosphere, and that's why you get black lines. Um, if it's just the gas by itself glowing, then you get white lines. But every element that's present is going to have its own unique signature, okay? So that's great, because you can use that for a lot of things. Now, if you have a star that's just sitting here, and it's not moving towards you or away from you, everything's great, nothing's ever going to change. But if there's something tugging on that star, there are times when it's going to be moving away from you and times when it's going to be moving towards you, okay? And you can actually measure that. And by measuring those lines shifting, because as the object is moving towards you, all of those lines are going to shift slightly towards the blue. And as it moves away from you, they're all going to start shifting towards the red. You can measure that, you can figure out how much mass does it take to cause that shift in the spectrum. And from that point, you can figure out what you're dealing with. You know it's too small to be a star, so it has to be a planet. So it's a very, very effective way of um, doing it. And 51 Pegasi, the first exoplanet around another star that we talked about, that's exactly how it was discovered, through radial velocity measurements. And you can see in this graph, there are times when it's going away from you at 50 meters per second, and times when it's coming towards you at 50 meters per second. And it's a nice side curve there, so it all makes sense. The only problem is, with using radial velocity measurements, because when we first started getting this data in, all we were seeing were hot Jupiters, basically. Okay? Large planets, Jupiter, Jupiter-sized planets are larger, that were extremely close to their star. So at first it was kind of giving us a, a skewed view of, of what's really going on out there. Uh, because it, has, it, it does have limits. So as we say here, radial velocity. Great for finding Jupiter-sized worlds very, very close to their stars, but not effective at all for finding Earth-sized planets. So that's where the transit method comes in. And this one is really easy to understand. As a planet passes in front of its parent star, there's going to be a very, very slight drop in brightness. Okay? It's just like, you know, we've seen Venus transit our sun and we've seen Mercury transit our sun. It's exactly the same thing. And as you can imagine, the amount of difference in the light that's coming from the stars is very, very small, but it, it is detectable. Um, 
The one drawback to this method is obviously you can only detect planets with systems that are actually edge on to your line of sight. Okay? If it's flipped 90 degrees and the planets are going around it like that, then obviously you're not going to have to try. So I think it's only about 15% or so that are close enough to your line of sight. Okay? But if you look at a big enough sample, uh, you can start to get an idea of what's happening. The nice thing about the transit method, you can detect planets of all sizes and all distances from the host star. And in fact, that's exactly what they've done. Uh, they've detected planets much, much larger than Jupiter, and they've detected planets all the way down to about twice the mass of the Earth. They haven't quite gotten to uh, Earth mass yet, but, but they'll get there as the data, as the data improves. Hello? Go ahead, have that looked at. Of course, doing stuff from the ground is, can be quite effective. And our technology in ground-based telescopes has really improved quite a bit. But if you really want to do this kind of work because of the sensitivity that's required, you really need to get off the Earth's surface, out from underneath our atmosphere, and out into space. And that's exactly what they did with the Kepler Space Telescope. Um, and the Kepler Telescope was designed specifically, <coughs> for the most part, it did other work, but it was designed specifically um, to detect exoplanets. And in that picture on the left, you can see a picture, that's actually the camera or the detector. And this is about, I guess, about 14 inches square. So if you think about the size of the sensor in, in the camera that you might have at home, this is a, a totally different animal. Um, so it has the ability to look at a large area of the sky. And what they did is they, they picked a location uh, in the constellation of Cygnus. If you go out tonight and look straight overhead, you'll see the Milky Way. You won't because there's clouds. But if there weren't, you'd see the Milky Way going overhead, and you'd see the cross of Cygnus. That's where Kepler was looking. And basically what it did is it just kept looking at this one area, and it would measure the brightness of every star in its field of view, which is approximately 150,000 stars. So if you're going to find exoplanets, if you're going to find these transits, that's the perfect way to do it. Uh, and so actually the bulk of exoplanets that have been discovered uh, were discovered by Kepler using this technique. Now, once you know something exists, right, it's, it's a lot easier to find, all right? Uh, and that's, that's true of, of a lot of things. So now we can actually do direct energy. Something that earlier that I said wasn't possible, well, not really so much. And a part of that reason is because techniques have improved so much. So what you're looking at is a, a movie made by the Keck Telescope, um, and planets, four planets orbiting a star in Pegasus. Now this is seven years worth of data. It took a long time to collect this. And the way they did it, you see that dark disk at the very center? Um, that's actually an occulting disk, and that's to block most of the light that's coming from the star. So it doesn't enter the telescope, and they have a chance of seeing the faint planets. Now you'll notice the distance scale at the bottom is 20 AU. An astronomical unit is the distance, mean distance between the sun and the earth, right? So it's about 93 million miles. And it's a very convenient measurement that we use in astronomy quite a bit. Uh, these planets are actually very, very far away from their host star. Uh, they're on the order of the distance to Neptune, Pluto, that kind of a distance is what we're looking at. So these are very slow orbits, part of the reason why it took so long to collect this data. Um, but it's pretty striking to actually see the solar system uh, and actually see the planets in motion. Absolutely fantastic. And we we're also able to, to uh, image uh, a transit, but before the transit and after the transit. So here you have a planet that's 11 times the size of Jupiter, or the mass of Jupiter, that's transiting a star 63 light years away. Uh, and yet we are able to image it, which, which again to me is just absolutely amazing and remarkable that we can see these things at all. Okay, I love this picture. So as we saw earlier, we can actually image um, stars and planetary systems in formation. <coughs> this is another one of those images. It's pretty distant, 400 light years away from Earth. And you can see the bright spot in the middle. Uh, the star has probably already started 
burning its fuel, but it's so encased in dust that you really can't see much of it. But you can see that ring of dust and material and gas uh, that's orbiting. And see that little bright spot? That's actually a very large planet that's forming within this system. So quite amazing. Uh, people have thought about how this might actually work uh, in real life, but it's not something that we've ever really seen. So um, a picture like this is just, you know, that actually blows me away. It really does. And it's also possible, you can see there's another dim dot next to where the star would be. It's possible that that could be another planet. But it gets even weirder, okay? So we can accept, yeah, okay, all stars, if not most stars, have planets, anywhere from one or two to several, like in our own solar system. But that's not the end of the story as far as planets in our galaxy and in other galaxies. Because there are such things known as rogue planets. And what rogue planets are, these are planets that are floating through our galaxy minding their own business. They're not in orbit around a star, okay? They're just out there in the dark and cold all by themselves. Um, and the way they discovered these, similar to what they did with Kepler, they took a space telescope, they looked at a specific place in space with a number of stars, and they just watched. And every once in a while, they would see a gravitational lensing event or some other indication that a body had passed in front of a certain star. Um, and then mathematically, they're able to figure out that there could be a hundred times more rogue planets than stars in the Milky Way. Now, these numbers are very, very squishy, uh, obviously, but even if, if there are just as many rogue planets as there are stars in the Milky Way, that is actually phenomenal to think that there are these things that are just careening around out there, um, not doing much of anything. But they're not necessarily cold and dead worlds. Um, there are two ways you can make a rogue planet. As I mentioned, making a solar system is a very violent process. And planets will migrate. You'll have Jupiter-sized planets that start moving in towards the star and other planets will move. And the orbits can get disrupted gravitationally. And if you do it just the right way, a planet can actually get ejected from the solar system and just thrown out into interstellar space. So that's one way uh, that road planets are formed. Um, if it is ejected early in the history of the solar system, even a planet the size of Earth is going to have a very thick atmosphere. Could have hydrogen, could have helium, because Earth is well capable of holding onto those gases. It has enough gravity. And if you have a thick enough atmosphere, you can generate energy, you can generate heat. And so you have all these different effects, radioactive uh, decay, um, and if it has a moon, then you're going to have gravitational effects, which will also heat the planet. So it's possible that if you have these things going on in an early planet, that there's enough energy and there's enough warmth to actually keep water and liquid at the surface, which is absolutely astounding. Here you have a planet that doesn't have a source of heat outside of it, but it can generate its own heat for millions, if, if not millions of years, at least for a certain period of time. So who knows what's going on in the rogue planets? We have no idea. But along with planets getting ejected from solar systems, you get all of the other junk ejected from solar systems. Uh, how many of you heard of uh, Amuamua? Yeah, more than a couple of them. You should know <laughs> uh, So back in, I think it was, do you know the year? It was a couple of years ago. It wasn't that long. Um, where this object was discovered, and we only discovered it as it was kind of starting to exit the solar system. Um, but when they looked at its orbit and looked at its velocity, it had an orbital velocity that was much too high to be bound to the sun. So that means it came from interstellar space to once it returned to interstellar space. And this is the first object of this kind uh, that we actually had seen. And uh, it means, Oumuamua means scouter messenger in Hawaii, which is kind of interesting. But it's a fascinating body because if you look at it, this is, this is an artist's depiction of what it might look 
look like as far as its shape. Um, you don't get asteroids that are long cigar shapes. It's just not really a natural shape. They tend to be broken down and be round in shape. Um, it never did any outgassing, so it wasn't a comet. Very unusual shape for an asteroid. It had one more trick up its sleeve. As it was leaving the solar system, it started to accelerate. I'm not going to say anything about that. If you want to know more, look up Avi Loeb. Uh, he's got a lot to say about this kind of stuff and about this object in particular. But to this day, we do not know what this object was. So, very interesting stuff. But this was the first object in our solar system that we detected of interstellar origin. And no doubt there have been others, but we just never realized what they were. And this was actually this is its actual path that it took. And I think I put the year in here. Yeah, 20, 2017. Um, where it passed very close to the sun inside the orbit of Mercury, fairly close to Venus. Interestingly enough, fairly close to Earth, about 20 million miles. Okay. So what's that? About 80 times the Earth moon distance. So it seems like a long way, but if you're gonna throw something at the solar system at random. It's interesting that it passed that close to us. So again, look up Bobby Bowman. Now that's not the only interstellar object that we detected. We actually detected uh, an interstellar comet. And what's interesting about this comet is that it is just like any other comet that we've ever seen. The only thing that gives it away as an interstellar object is its speed through the solar system again, just like a Moa Moa, uh, it's not bound to the solar system gravitation. But as far as the gases that were present, everything else, dead stop coming. So it's a good it, it's a good way of understanding that the same processes of formation that we have here in our solar system have happened some elsewhere in the galaxy. So this was actually his 21 Borisov. Uh, Borisov is an amateur astronomer um, in Russia. Uh, who actually discovered it. So we actually still have comets that are discovered by, by amateur observers, which is kind of cool. Okay, now we have also discovered um, that we have had meteors that have an interstellar origin. Right now we know of two because they can, when a meteor comes through, if they're tracking it, which Space Command does, they can run its path backwards figure out what its orbit was, what its speed was. So that's how they identified these as being of interstellar origin. And uh, this one landed in the ocean near Papua New Guinea in 2014. And they're actually, if they haven't done it already, they're actually starting to think about uh, going down there and uh, deep diving and seeing if they can retrieve any of this material. Uh, these, the, the thing that was unusual about these two meteors is they broke up at a very, very low altitude. If you take a, a, a meteorite that's a meteor, it, that's made totally of iron, they'll usually break up at around 50, 60 miles above the Earth. These things came all the way down to 45, which indicates when you do the math that they were made of something that was much, much stronger than essentially the stainless steel that, that nickel iron meteors are, meteors are made of. So that's an indication the other way that, well, maybe there are things going on in these other solar systems that are quite different from what happened here. Um, and undoubtedly, there are meteorites in collections across the world that had an interstellar origin. It's just that they were never tracked. Uh, they probably haven't uh, dated most of those meteorites, because if you take an interstellar meteorite, it's not going to be 4.6 uh, billion years old. It's going to give you some other number, because it's coming from a system that started at a different time than our own. But fascinating to think that these things are out there. So I'm going to let you digest this for a moment. <coughs> We tend to think the Earth is special, unique. It really, really isn't. It's about as unique as a single grain of sand on a beach. There's a lot of other single grains of sand on that beach. So let's look at the numbers. The best estimate puts the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy at somewhere between 100 to 400 billion. Okay? So this is one of those squishy numbers. You can't actually count all the stars in the Milky Way. You can't see all the stars in the Milky Way. So, you know, the best guess estimate. So that's why there's such an error range. So we're going to take 200 billion 
as kind of a, a, a good starting round number. Okay? So that's how many stars, more or less, are in our own galaxy. So that data is showing us that every star is going to have at least two planets. So just based on that, and again, we're being very conservative, you're looking at 400 billion planets in the Milky Way galaxy. A certain percentage of these planets are going to be very much like Earth. In fact, there are probably so many of these planets that are very much like Earth. What's the population on Earth right now is about 7.6, 7.8 billion, right around in there. There are enough Earth-like planets. You get one, you get one, you get one. <laughs> Everybody gets a planet because there's just darn so many of them out there. Right? The Jupiter ones, we can't even give those away. I think Exxon was kind of more interested in those anyway. But, um, yeah, I mean, think about that. It's, it's just a, 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 an incredible thing to, to get into your head. But we haven't included everything yet. So if you include the lowest estimate for rogue planets, then we're up to 800 billion planets in the Milky Way galaxy. And the Milky Way is just one of 20 trillion galaxies in, in I can see heads popping everywhere, um, in the observable universe, which gives you the total number of planets in the universe, 1.6 times 10 to the 25, 16 septillion planets in the known observable universe, which is just, I can't wrap my head around a number, I can't wrap my head around a million or a billion, never mind a number like this. So just know that there's an inexhaustible supply. Every environment, every possibility, anything, no matter how exotic that you could come up with, probably exists out there somewhere. <coughs> And that also means a lot for the possibilities of life in our galaxy and life in the universe. Because if it turns out, and I think we're very, very close to finding out, uh, mostly with the information that we're getting from the Mars uh, rovers, um, that life is just something that chemistry does. It's something that the universe does. Which means, if there are that many planets, think of all the different possibilities for what kind of life can develop. So what's next? Now the James Webb Space Telescope is now up and operating, and it's really starting to give us some great data. Um, and one of the main reasons that Webb was built and designed the way it is, is part of its task is to take a closer look at these exoplanets. So now, you know, we're finding exoplanets, we're getting basic data about uh, mass and distance from the star and all that kind of stuff. So we're at the point where we really want to start finding out more. And Webb is capable of doing that. And what Webb can do, when a star, when a planet transits a star, right, you can imagine seeing this planet in front of a star, and its whole atmosphere is going to be lit up. It's going to be illuminated from behind. So the starlight's going to be going through the atmosphere and then coming towards us. Webb is sensitive enough that it can actually detect that spectrum and, and tease it out from the spectrum from the star. And once you can do that, once you can start seeing the spectrum, as I mentioned before, you can start seeing elemental signatures. So you can start to look at these exoplanet atmospheres and actually see what they're made up of. And we've already had a successful observation. Um, this one particular, it's a gas giant, it's called WASP 39B. Um, and they detected uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of this planet. That's the first such detection that, we, that was ever made. And if you think about this, this also has implications for the life side of things too. Because if you're looking at an exoplanet atmosphere and you see large amounts of methane, you see large amounts of oxygen, those are normally not things that will hang out in an atmosphere of a planet very well particularly oxygen, because it wants to react with it. So you have, you have methane, you have oxygen, it's being replaced. And, and the best way to make these things is through biology. Now, if you start to see large amounts of carbon dioxide, 
ozone and other pollutants, then you're starting to get into the markers that would indicate a technological civilization. So you can do much more than just say, yeah, there's life or there isn't life or there might be life. Okay? So it, it starts to get very, very interesting very, very quickly. Um, and if we do find life outside of the Earth and we don't find it on Mars, these exoplanets, there's got to be one out there that has it. So in theory, there's no limit to how large a telescope can be, particularly if you put a telescope in space, right? You, you can make a telescope the, the size of the Earth, okay? Um, and we already do that with radio telescopes. Um, but you can do it with optical, too. It's, it's just a matter of engineering. It doesn't break the law of physics. And it is possible to conceive of a telescope that is large enough that you can get pictures of exoplanets, at least the ones that are fairly close, um, that are comparable to like weather images that you would get a planet with. So you're going to be able to see the landforms, oceans if present, signs of life, uh, city lights, whatever, whatever might be present. You put a big enough telescope, you can actually observe these things uh, directly. So that's really where the future is. And hopefully it's going to be uh, uh, pretty exciting. Uh, so I'm going to open it up to questions and uh, see, what, uh, see what we've got. Yes? You said that the, the planets are throwing the stars off of their orbits a little bit, and that's how you're able to detect it. Do we know how much ours throw our, the our sun off? It's yeah, I, I remember reading it somewhere. What you end up with is sort of like a center of gravity. So both the star will, will, and the planet will go around that mutual center of gravity. The star moves a little bit, the planet moves a lot. I think the center of gravity for the solar system is actually within the sun itself. So the sun has a radial velocity because of the other planets, mostly Jupiter and the gas giants. Um, but the shift isn't, isn't huge. But it is, it, it is there. So any star that has a, another body or that's orbiting it is going to have that. It's going to have that shape. It's just not always going to be easy to see or be, uh, or be detected. Yes? Are you hiring? <laughs> <laughs> Am I hiring or are we hiring? <laughs> this is fascinating, of course. Um, and I think I understand some of what you're saying. Okay. It's fabulous. Um, are there other enterprises such as this Space History Museum uh, that are doing much of the same thing, or are you are you cooperating with other such institutes? Oh gosh, yeah. I mean, there there are a lot of other museums that include astronomy as part of what they talk about and what they deal with, and uh, we're associated with the Smithsonian. We're all kind of one big club, and so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are many other places. Anything else? <coughs> yes. I'm uh, curious about this thing about the uh, row of planets. <laughs> row of planets. Okay, cool. They, yeah. they, they don't orbit around anything. They don't orbit around So they're around just anything. flying around through space. They are flying around through space. If this thing is flying around like this and it comes near, let's say it's a fairly small uh, uh, rogue planet, yeah. and it goes near something large like a star, what, what would keep it from getting captured by the star, is it going fast enough, the, the velocity such that it'll shoot by? It all depends on the relative velocity. And That's the even, sum total of everything. Then. Right, right of, of, the, of the star that it's approaching versus itself. Um, now stars are moving, they're orbiting the center of our galaxy, so for all these stars that are out there, they have a motion. Um, but there's also something called a standard of rest for our part of the galaxy. And sometimes it'll be the object that's just sitting there and the star kind of comes by. So there's, there's a lot of different motions. But just like a, a Moamoa, the reason that it wasn't captured is because it was traveling too fast. Okay. So if you were to have a rogue planet, let's say you're gonna have, I'm gonna, I'm gonna paint a doomsday scenario here, but let's say you had a planet 10 times the size of Jupiter, which we know they're out there. And let's say it enters our solar system. The first thing it's going to encounter is going to be the Oort cloud, right? Really far out there beyond Pluto. And that's where millions of comets are just hanging out, right? 
So it's gravitational, it's going to disrupt the Oort comet. It's going to send a lot of those uh, comets careening in towards the sun and the inner solar system. That's very bad for us, because we would be in the middle of a huge shooting gallery at that point. And cometary impacts are very bad. If it continues on into the solar system, among the orbits of the other planets, it's going to gravitationally disrupt, or at least affect, uh, the orbits of the other planets in the system. Uh, so again, you could have ejections, um, and as far as Earth is concerned, even if you just change the orbit a little bit, you know, our climate totally gets going. So um, these are not things that you really want to invite for a visit. Uh, we want to keep them way out there in cold, dark space. But as far as whether they get captured or not, it's just it's the relative velocity in which that answers that question. Okay. If these things are, are traveling, so they're not traveling linearly, then they must be like a, like a, uh, what do you call it, pinball machine or something that's kind of going this way and then this no, way. And maybe no, they're, they're traveling upon in the, what it goes by. Like everything else in the galaxy, they're traveling in their own independent orbit around the center of the galaxy. Oh, really? Yeah. So uh, it's like any other star oh. or anything else that's there. You know, it has its own independent path uh, that goes around the center. Okay. So, yeah, they don't they don't swerve or, or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I have a question here. Did you have a question? Well, I, I had a silly question. And I oh, got, good. How do I claim my own planet? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Let me have your credit card and we'll talk about it later. <laughs> but more seriously, uh, you're talking about all of the planets and stars revolving around the center of the galaxy. Yes. So what's at the center of the galaxy that's creating that gravitational force? Well, a great concentration of, of matter, first of all. And then if you look at a galaxy like the Andromeda galaxy through a, even a small telescope, what you're going to see right away is this really, really bright, almost star-like nucleus. And then it gets very, very faint. As you go the so there's a lot of material that's packed in towards the center. Plus, our galaxies, and we think most galaxies, have supermassive black holes at their center, which are kind of pulling the strings. Okay. So I think you've probably seen that recent picture that they actually made yeah. uh, of a black hole. So super, and these are super, these are, these are, I don't know if it's billions, but millions of solar masses. These are huge objects. Yeah. Um, so yeah, everything orbits around. Could you explain how the rogue planets get their, can hold an atmosphere again and then produce their own heat? It's just because of the, the amount of gravity that they have. That those gases in the atmosphere, if, they, if they're not being heated or being affected by a star, are going to kind of just be trapped. They're not going to be stripped away, you're not going to lose it to space. Just the, the gravity of the planet alone will, will hold all these things in. So it's due to the star that these other exoplanets might not hold? or the, keep on reproducing the oxygen-methane? No, this is atmosphere. a different thing from the oxygen-methane question. This is just the original uh, atmosphere that a, uh, a rogue planet would possess. And if it gets ejected early in its life, it'll, it'll retain most of those things in the air. So it'll have a much, much thicker atmosphere than like the Earth has now. And as far, I think the other part of your question was, was how did it get heated? Yeah, so it's just like the... Um, like the greenhouse gas effect? Is that how it No, works? because there's no heat? sunlight entering. Remember, they're out there in the dark and cold, so the greenhouse stuff's not going to affect anything. But there are a couple of things. When planets form, they're slowly contracting. Okay, That develops heat in the core. The core is, is going to start off as molten, and will be molten for, for billions of years, just from its own um, gravitational contraction during formation. Also, the other thing that heats a planet internally is radioactive decay. And you have certain radioactive elements that have a relatively short decay time, um, you know, 10,000, 500,000. Um, and that, again, creates heat, and that heat is trapped. And that, again, heats the planet internally. Um, if you have a moon, if a planet gets ejected and retains a moon, okay, then you have those two objects that are tugging on each other. And that's kind of just like bending a paper clip back and forth. Uh, that also can heat the interior of the planet without needing to start to do it. As a matter of fact, if you look at you know, Europa and some of the other moons that are around Jupiter and Saturn, these are big ice balls that actually have a liquid ocean underneath the ice. 
And the reason they can have a liquid ocean is because the immense gravity of, let's say, Jupiter is constantly squeezing and pulling and squeezing and pulling. And that generates a lot of energy internally uh, in those moons. So there, there, there are other ways that you can heat things that don't require to have a storm. Yes? Have um, anybody ever come up with a trillion galaxies? Uh, I think it was 20 trillion. Was that, was that what I had up there, 20 trillion? Um, it's an estimate. I mean, you look, you, obviously it's like stars in the, milk, in, the, in the Milky Way, right? You can't count them all. Uh, you can't even see them. All. It's the same thing with galaxies. But they'll look at a specific part of the sky and other parts of the sky, and they will do counts, and from that they can extrapolate. Okay, do the math. This is about how many. And again, it's one of those squishy numbers. I just read something the other day that that estimate might be low. Because in some of the observations that they made with James Webb, they actually discovered uh, they saw more galaxies than they expected to. And so again, you know, these, these numbers always change. You know, and they're, they're never absolutely accurate. But you know, they're they're order of magnitude kind of stuff. Anything else? It's a big subject. Yes. What 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 do you see as the next? technology that we do not have today that you think will be uh, perhaps a much more revealing technology for what we know today. As far as looking at stuff? Yes, yes. Yeah. Especially looking at stuff. Um, really kind of two things. Um, as I mentioned, much bigger telescopes. Yeah. Because, again, there's no limit. Um, so with a telescope big enough, you can see pretty much anything that you want to see. Um, if there is a civilization, civilization out there 65 million years distant, and they had a big enough telescope, they could be watching the dinosaur asteroid event right now in real time. So, you know, the, the, what you can do is, 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 is pretty amazing. The other thing that I think is going to be changing is that actually sending very small probes at least to the nearest star, which is Proxima Centauri. It's about 4.3 uh, light years away. And it has a planet, by the way, too. Um, so uh, there are some programs that are looking at basically putting a, a probe, interplanetary probe on a chip, very small, very, very light, and then attaching it to a light sink and using really powerful lasers on Earth to push these light sails uh, to very, very high speeds. Uh, a large fraction, like 0.4, half the speed of light, um, in which case you can get to Alpha Centauri, I think, in about 10 years or so. Um, so it's 10 years to get out there, 10 years for the observations to come back. So within 20 years, you can actually get a look, a very close look at one of these systems. So there are probably two things, the two things that I would expect probably to happen. Um, yeah, for the future, within the next 20 years. Definitely. Yes? And the, your, I think it was your very first slide. You said something about that we just started discovering additional galaxies in like 93 or something. Did you say? Say that again. Yeah, no. Um, the first detection of an exon. Oh. And that was around right with the pulsar, right? The oh. weird neutron star thing. Um, they discovered the first three exoplanets. <laughs> And those planets were probably always originally there when that pulsar was a real star. And you know, apparently the explosion of that star and the creation of the pulsar and all of that stuff did not eject the planets from the system. So they were still there. Unless, you, know, you could always get into, well, maybe when these things happen and pulsars are formed, maybe planets form at that time. But different way. You know, we don't really know. I misunderstood the statement. It's like, didn't we know that there were other I could have said it wrong. That's quite No, positive. you didn't. I okay. just don't know enough to know. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the first observation. Anybody else? Yes? You mentioned, I believe, that there are some meteorites that are more durable, break up out of the out. Yeah. And they may be made of an unusual material. Exactly. Did anybody ever put a name to that material? No, because we don't know what it is. All we know is that those two extraterrestrial um, meteors that were observed by Space Command um, 
they broke up at a much lower altitude than uh, iron meteorites normally break up. And that's all we know. So until they actually go down there and recover some of that material, uh, we, have, we have no way of knowing. I think it probably would be within the periodic table. One would hope. One would yeah. hope. <laughs> if it's not on the periodic table or even possibly be on the periodic table, then we've got to rethink you know, what we think we know. Um, so, because we understand that stuff pretty well. Um, but I think one thing that we've seen as we look out into, the, into space and into the universe is that we see pretty much the same stuff that we see here. Uh, we see the same materials, we see the same gases, we see the same laws of physics operating you know, 100 light years away as they do here. So I think for the most part, when you go out into space, you're going to be finding a lot of what you're already familiar with. Okay? But every once in a while, you're going to find something really exciting. Maybe one of the meteorites will be all in shock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. In the back way back there. Yeah. First of all, I, I want to say that it's, it's really advantageous to us to have so much that's so vast out there that we don't know it. Yeah. Because it gives our, our, our creativity and our imaginations room to flex, where right? if, if all of this was handed to us in a textbook, like in sixth grade math, we wouldn't learn as much. So I think that's really cool. But my question is about the slide that you had that showed the star forming in the center, and it had the ring of debris yeah. from the building of the star, and then it had the planet, maybe two planets in the center. I'm assuming that centrifugal forces of the forming of the star is what created that ring of debris? Right, you have, when you start with this big gas cloud, right? Mm -hmm. Gas and dust. And it has its own slow rotation, okay? And as it gets compressed, and as it compresses itself, that rotation rate goes up. And the natural uh, outcome of that is you tend, to, you tend to, as you rotate faster and faster, the material tends to flatten out as a disk in the plane of rotation. Ah, okay. And so that's why you have those protoplanetary disks, why they're so well formed. Thank you. Yeah. And the, thing about, and the thing about learning, I mean, yeah, you can read your astronomy textbook when you're in college, but, you know, they have to rewrite it every few years because, you know, stuff is always changing. So, there's nothing more really worthless than an astronomy textbook that was written more than 20 years ago. At least if it's talking about current events. So yeah, good question about that. Anybody else? Did we get everybody? Uh, I think that's about it. Well, thanks for coming today. I'm going to bring up Kathy. Oh, she's right here. Surprise! Uh, yeah. <laughs> Fill you guys in on what's going to be happening at the museum over the next week or so. Thank you very much.